Well, good morning. Glad, glad you can be with us on this uh, slightly less hot Sunday. A reminder that uh, next week we're going to be having the golf tournament. That's right. Sunday afternoon, one o'clock. And uh, we'll see. I think what I, Bill wanted me to come out and bless the golfers, and I think what I want to do is I want to bless half the golfers and, let, and see which half does better. <laughs> see if it really makes a difference or not. We'll see. But Sue, you have an announcement about stuff we have this afternoon, or right after service, that is. You didn't read your bulletin. <laughs> we confer. Good morning. This is an exciting morning. It is um, uh, ministry fair and sneak a peek all rolled into one. We've never done that before, so I'm going to tell you how it's going to work. So following worship, those of you who are parents with children, and um, I'm not sure, let's see, I'm not seeing Miles to find out if we have somebody who's going to be downstairs for the youth. But you can take a look at the classrooms. So meet me at Noah's Ark in the weekday entrance, and I have a handout for you. And you have the opportunity to get to meet the teachers and leaders in our Sunday school program for our children. That um, We have some changes this year that you're going to want to know about. Also, I want to call everybody's attention to our CE office. It has been transformed into a workspace, storage space for all things education by Christy Shaw and Christy Soul. And if you have not seen what's been going on down there, I encourage you to take a little walk down the hall and check out what's new in the CE office. So, so that's sneak a peek from 10.30 until 11. You'll have a chance to meet the teachers upstairs and downstairs in that education wing. For the rest of you who maybe don't have children in the program anymore, Ministry Fair starts right after worship in Heartland Hall. And if you are interested in Christian education activities, we have people at the children's, youth, and adult team tables, as well as all of the activities and committees and teams of the church. There are representatives in there. The kids will have a special activity that they will be able to do after sneak a peek, so they'll want to meet me at the table in, right in the entrance of Heartland Hall to get started with that. It's fun. And there are refreshments in the corner. There are some snacks and surprise things at some people's tables. So either way, where, whichever way you want to go, either start with sneak a peek and then work your way to, to the ministry fair or go right into ministry fair. And then next Sunday, Sunday school begins, and I'm not going to tell you about the classes because you can go to the ministry fair and find out more. All right. <clears throat> Good morning, my friends. All right. Uh, we are making all kinds mm -hmm. of joyful noise here today. Um, I am Carrie DeVries. I'm the praise team leader most of the time when I'm in this building. But when I'm at my work, I'm Mrs. DeVries, music teacher. So I get very excited about involving all of our young musicians, all of our young children in all music all the time. So even if they can't read the words, even if they don't know the words to our praise song this morning of We Are, We Are the Light of the World, they get to play. So Mr. Daniel is over there. Can you wave? Can you all see Mr. Daniel? Can you wave at Mr. Daniel? There he is. So if you are holding an instrument, then you play with Mr. Daniel. So whatever he does, you can do. When he's not playing, you're not playing either. So you can hold it or you can put it by your side, whatever keeps our instrument quiet during the quiet times. So nod your head if you understand what we're doing. Thank you very much. Oh, all right. Sorry, one last thing. When we are moving into the time with children, that is when our instruments will come up and get put in or around this basket, because this basket won't be enough to hold all of them. So I will be putting this basket right here, and that's where our instruments will return. Say, okay. okay. Thank you.
to see you. Let me hear you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Pray with us. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. continue on to, I want to thank everyone that came and took part yesterday, whether you intended or whether you took part in singing or many other ways that we helped support Linda Hoffman and family on Joe's memorial service. It was a wonderful time and we were so glad to see many people there from Joe's life. And we're thankful for all of the folks here at Grace Covenant who took part also. Let's join now together in this call to worship. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Darkness was over the oh, deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering above the waters. Jesus was sent to the Spirit of truth to teach us and give us peace.
want to invite the children to come up for a moment, and then I'm going to invite any of our children and teachers, anybody who's going back to school to come and join me. So come up, put your instrument in the basket, and then come on over and join me. Nice job, everybody, with the instruments. Very, very cool. Some of you brought your backpacks. That is awesome. How many of you have started school already? How many have a first day tomorrow? Anybody? Yeah. So how are you feeling about school so far? Good? Good? I'm seeing all thumbs up. So anybody, are you feeling a little nervous? Maybe a little bit? Yeah. Yeah? Mello's got a big thumbs up. What? You're still a little bit nervous even though you've already been there for your first day? That's normal. Yep. Anybody feeling excited about anything already? Evie, what are you feeling excited about? You're excited to go to your new school. Aiden, what about you? Awesome! I'm excited for you. Henry, what are you excited about? Because I'm going to do what? Oh, oh cool. <laughs> you need to go visit with Joe at the Kairos booth and talk about those wind turbines. She would love to talk with you. So, how many of you brought backpacks with you? Awesome. Good deal. And if you didn't bring a backpack, that's okay. I'm going to need one volunteer to help me pass these out. Melo, I saw your hand first. So if you'll take the basket, and if you just want to start at this end and work your way, and we need the adults too, we are going to bless your backpacks, and you're going to be blessed with a tag that can, you can put on there. I'm going to read one for you. So you know what it says. On the first side, one side it says, peace be upon you, which is a blessing. And on the back it says, this backpack has been blessed by your church family, Grace Covenant Presbyterian Church. We love and support you. May peace be yours all year. It's a visual reminder of the thing that I want you to remember every day, all the time, whether you're excited or you're nervous, if you're worried, and that is that God is always with you. No matter where you go, no matter what you are feeling, God is there and loves you. And remember, your church loves and supports you too. As soon as everybody has a tag, I'm going to invite you to stand up with me and we're going to do a blessing together. I have one here. Carrie, I'll give you mine. How about on the floor? Here, I will help you, Mello. I will get the ones down on the floor. If you will finish that pew and the pew behind them. Who else needs one? Magnolia got one. Bristol. Rowan. There you go. How many other teachers? Back here, Mello. Mello, come back here to Harold. All right. All of our teachers, educators, all of our kids, please stand. And we're going to pray together and bless these backpacks and our tags. Mel, I'll take that, and we were going to pray together. Let's pray. God of fresh starts and new beginnings, we bring ourselves with our big feelings and our backpacks to you. In our backpacks, we carry blank pages, sharpened pencils, and pointy crayons. And in our hearts, we carry big feelings, unanswered questions, and hopeful expectations. There are endless possibilities of what this new year might bring of what we might learn, who we might meet, 
and who we might become. God, our friend who is always with us, be with us through it all. Be with us as we ride the bus. Be with us as we walk. Be with us as we buckle seat belts, zip up jackets, and tie our shoes. However we get there and whatever we wear, bless this journey into something new. And for all of our grown-ups who are going back to school, be with them too. Thank you for our teachers, our helpers, our caregivers and leaders, and for all they do to help us learn and grow. God, our friend who's full of wonder, fill their hearts and bless their hands. Amen. All right, blessings on you, and you may go back to your seats. The blessing. There are some left over. If you have someone that you would like to take one for after the service, I'm going to leave these on the communion table and you can help yourself. One of the hardest things for us to do as followers of Jesus Christ is admit the times that we, quite bluntly, ignore the teachings of Christ. So please join me now in this prayer of confession together. Eternal God, our judge and redeemer, we confess that we have tried to hide from you, for we have done wrong. We have lived for ourselves and apart from you. We have turned from our neighbors and refused to bear the burdens of others. We have ignored the pain of the world and passed by the hungry, the poor, and the oppressed. In your great mercy, forgive our sins and free us from selfishness, that we may choose your will and obey your commandments through Jesus Christ, our Savior. God's justice feels like grace like generosity, like love itself. God's justice is, in fact, mercy and reconciliation. It's compassion filling in all the gaps that we leave behind. We are worthy simply because God loves us. God restores all things to their original creation in God's heart. Friends, recognize you are forgiven and be at peace. And may the peace of Christ be with you. Please greet each other with a sign of peace. This morning's scripture lesson from the Gospels is from Luke chapter 18, verses 18 to 30, as found in the Common English Bible. A certain ruler asked Jesus, Good teacher, what must I do to obtain eternal life? And Jesus replied, Why do you call me good? No one is good except the one God. You know the commandments. Don't commit adultery, don't murder, don't steal, don't give false testimony, 
Honor your father and mother. Then the ruler said, I've kept all these things since I was a boy. When Jesus heard this, he said, there's one more thing. Sell everything you own and distribute the money to the poor. Then you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. When he heard these words, the man became sad because he was extremely rich. When Jesus saw this, he said, it's very hard for the wealthy to enter God's kingdom. It's easier for a camel to squeeze through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter God's kingdom. Those who heard this said, then who can be saved? And Jesus replied, what is impossible for humans is possible for God. Peter said, look, we left everything we own and followed you. And Jesus said to them, I assure you that anyone who has left house, husband, wife, brothers, sisters, parents, or children because of God's kingdom will receive many times more in this age and eternal life in the coming age. Walking the wayside, lost on a lonely road. I was chasing the high life, trying to satisfy my soul. All the lies I believed in left me crying like the rain. Then I saw lightning from heaven, and I met. I'm gonna shout about it. I am a child of love. I found a world of freedom. I found a friend of Jesus. I am a child of love. I felt the sting of the fire, but I saw you in the flame. Just when I thought it was over, you broke me out of the grave. I'm gonna talk about it, I'm gonna shout about it. I am a child of love. I found a world of freedom, I found a friend of Jesus. I am a child of love. Yeah.
Okay, this morning's scripture lesson from the prophets comes from the book of Amos, the fifth chapter, verses 14 to 15 and 21 to 24. Seek God and not evil that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of heavenly forces, will be with you just as you have said. Hate evil, love good, and establish justice at the city gate. Perhaps the Lord God of heavenly forces will be gracious to what is left of Joseph. And continuing at verse 21, I hate, I reject your festivals. I don't enjoy your joyous assemblies. If you bring me your entirely burnt offerings and gifts of food, I won't be pleased. I won't even look at your offerings of well-fed animals. Take away the noise of your songs. I won't listen to the melody of your harps. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Holy wisdom, holy words. jumped. Oh well, let's go this way. A few weeks ago, Stephen Wing was our guest preacher, and he reminded us that as followers of Jesus Christ, our first responsibility is to love God with all our heart, soul, and mind. That is the base of what we are as followers of Jesus Christ. We have to start there. Then comes the second part of that great commandment from Jesus, the part that says to love our neighbors as ourselves. That is part of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, to do all those things. Scripture was based on that one thing, that great commandment to love God and to love our neighbors as ourselves. And Jesus went on to say, all the teachings of Moses that were found in the law, and all the teachings of the prophets came from that source. That doesn't mean there aren't important teachings in the other Scriptures. Today's lesson from the prophet Amos describes a specific situation in Israel, but it's also an eye-opener today. Because Amos starts by reminding the people that God expects certain things from them. Seek good and not evil, that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of heavenly forces, will be with you just as you have said. Hate evil, love good, and establish justice at the city gate. Keep in mind the city gate would be the main entrance into the city, and justice had to start from the very beginning of that place. But then comes a rather... I don't know, interesting passage of Scripture when you read it. This is God speaking to the people. I hate, I reject your festivals. I don't enjoy your joyous assemblies. If you bring me your entirely burned offerings and gifts of food, I won't be pleased. I won't even look at your offerings of well-fed animals. Take away the yoke of your song, the sound of your songs. I won't listen to the melody of your harps. According to the Lord, Damus, these are the words of the Lord, but I can't help but think those words must have stung pretty much the people hearing them. Just like people here. They spend a lot of time preparing for worship, practicing their music, coming up with all the right kinds of offerings, all to be told that none of it amounts to anything. That God not only does it not amount to anything, God actually despises it. Because why? Because we haven't done the basics. As Amos reminds him again, Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an everlasting stream. It was a reminder that to truly love God and worship God 
calls for us to make caring for others our priority. But not just feeding them or caring for them when they're sick. God demands that we seek justice for others. It's a little something that I like to call social justice. Back in 2010, a popular radio and television host, who will go unnamed, was at the height of his popularity, and it was then he suggested that any church promoting social justice or economic justice merely was using code words for Nazism and communism. He said, I beg you, look for the words social justice or economic justice on your church website. If you find it, run as fast as you can. Social justice and economic justice are code words. I'm advising people to leave their churches, yes. If you have a priest that is pushing social justice, go find another parish. Go alert your bishop and tell them, excuse me, but are you down with this whole social justice thing? If it's my church, I'm alerting the church authorities. Excuse me, what's this social justice thing? And if they say, yes, we're all in on that social justice thing, then I'm in the wrong place. Well, if anyone believes as that commentator did, then it may be true that that person is not in the right place, especially if they are in the Presbyterian Church USA. Back in 1958, we made a statement that we live by today still within the church. And it affirms our connection. The General Assembly affirms its connection, its conviction, that is, that neither the church as the body of Christ nor Christians as individuals can be neutral or indifferent toward evil in the world. and affirms its responsibility to speak on social and moral issues for the encouragement and instruction of the church and its members, and also seeking earnestly both to know the mind of the church, Christ and to speak always in humility and love. It reminds us that churches is their duty not only to encourage and to train their people for daily living, daily obedience to God's will, but corporately, all of us together, to reveal God's grace in places of suffering and need, to resist the forces that tyrannize, and to support the forces that restore the dignity of all men as the children of God, for only so is the gospel most fully proclaimed. Excuse me for using just the word men. This was 1958. We weren't completely enlightened back then. If we'd, if we'd have known better. If that's not going far enough for you, look at a little thing called the Social Creed of 1908. People don't think of us as being really advocates, I think, sometimes for social justice that far back, but we were. In 1908, it was a very specific time in history, and the history buffs will know this thing, but this was, industrialization was really, really had taken off by that time. Few, much, few, many fewer people were in agriculture or living in small towns, and more people were moving to cities, working in industries. And it was also a time of some of the greatest disparity of wealth in the United States. It was an incredibly difficult time. And at that time, as part of the Federal Council of Churches, we Presbyterians issued this statement. We deem it the duty of all Christian people to concern themselves directly with certain practical industrial problems. To us, it seems that the churches must stand for, first of all, equal rights and complete justice for all men in all stations of life. Again, we're 1908, so they weren't saying men and women. With the right of all men to the opportunity for self-maintenance, a right ever to be wisely and strongly safeguarded against the encroachments of every kind. For the right of workers to some protection against the hardships often resulting from the swift crises of industrial change. 
We thought about, think about the people, it wasn't that long ago when we were talking about people having to change from working in industry to working in the information age. It's the same type of situation. When great changes are made, we have to think of those people. Also, for the protection of workers from dangerous machinery, occupational diseases, and mortality. People died right and left in those days in factories, whether it's because they had no such thing as OSHA, they had no such thing as oversight by the government of factories, and people were often in working in very unsafe conditions, and it was people of all ages and people of all genders working there. Also, for the regulation of conditions for women as such as they have safeguarded their physical and moral health of the community, to the suppression of the sweating system. You've heard the term sweatshops before. Well, there were many of them in the United States. And luckily, we don't have that many. There's still some here, but not that many here. We've just shipped them all to some other country and buy the goods that come from those sweatshops. Also, for the gradual and reasonable reduction of the hours of labor to the lowest practical point, and for the degree of leisure for all, which is a condition that are the highest of human life. For a release from employment one day in seven. If you're not hearing that right, they're saying we need to ask that people have one day a week off. Because people were working 24 hours a day, seven days a week different shifts, but there were always people working seven days a week. Anybody want to volunteer for that now? Some of us feel like we would do that, but I don't think so, not compared to that time. Also for a living wage, a phrase we use today and people poo-poo it, but think about it. A living wage is a minimum in every industry and for the highest wage that each industry can afford. For the most of excuse me, the most equitable division of the produce of industry that ultimately can be devised. If you're not a historian, go back on the web sometime later today and look up Gilded Age and look at the disparities of wealth and say some of these people made money at the, of course, at the detriment of others. For suitable provisions for the old age of the workers and for those incapacitated by injury. In other words, there wasn't any SSI for people who were injured. There was no Social Security in 1908. People were used up, spit out, and prayed that they had some family to take care of them. They went on to say, to the toilers of America, and to those who by organized effort are seeking to lift the crushing burdens of the poor and to reduce the hardships and uphold the dignity of labor, this council sends the greetings of human brotherhood and the pledge of sympathy and of help in a cause which belongs to all who follow Christ. It is good for us to help the poor, but if we don't also change the system that leads to poverty, we are falling short of creating justice at the city gates. That's why Grace Covenant is part of the Matthew 25 initiative with other Presbyterian churches in the United States, where we call to dismantle the structural racism and to eradicate systemic poverty. Those sound like big jobs, and they are, but they're the kinds of things that we have pledged to be part of. but I think we also have to go back to Amos and think about that. It's fantastic to be in here on Sundays, and especially when the music is getting us all pumped up and feeling good, or we feel it's just glorious to listen to the choir sing, to watch our children come up front. Those are all great things, but if the rest of the week we aren't in our daily lives and also together as a church doing things to help make changes in the world. Then we run a very good risk that God doesn't really care what we do on Sundays. There are some people that will say, for instance, that 
the purpose of the church is to worship God. We have worship. Here's a strange thought. It's not for God's purpose. God does not need us to worship God. Not from the standpoint of God sitting there going, gosh, if they don't come to me in prayer this week, I'll, I'll be depressed. Worship is for us. Worship's to remind us of the teachings of God when we look at the Scriptures. Worship is for us to be uplifted by the presence of each other and our prayers together, to know that we're caring for one another. But that's so that we can be equipped to go out the rest of the week and live out the calling of God to do social justice. It is very much a part of who we are. That's why we have both a mission and a Kairos team. Our mission team, a very few people often taking part in some of the activities, are working to try and help eradicate some poverty, to help feed people, and to do work that hands-on helps us connect with those in need. But it's our Kairos team that has the responsibility on our behalf of speaking out and advocating in the places in our world that we can speak out and to say, these things need to change, and we support that. To call into people's awareness of the things that are going wrong in the world. It's not because we feel superior, but because it's what God has asked us to do. No, not really asked. God tells us that's what we have to do. That's what it means to be a church of God. I think as we look back, we recognize that it's so easy to get busy doing these things as well as worship, some of our projects. Our church is busy during the week. We have people working hard to keep everything maintained and going. But if in the end it doesn't help equip us to go out into the world and make a change, we have to rethink our plans. But who we are, not just as Presbyterians, but as followers of Jesus Christ, are people that are called to care for others, not just in small ways, but in large ways too. May your voice be heard loudly among the world, especially when we speak together. Amen. And now it's time for our commissioning of the teachers. Do you want this? So we're going to do this a little bit differently because um, we, are, we are living in a, a Sunday school program that is always rotating. So I am going to invite anyone who is a part of our Sunday school program who may be teaching this year. So that I'm speaking especially to adult leadership. You may not be scheduled to teach yet, but you more than likely will teach. I'm going to invite you to join us too. So if you will please stand where you are. Teachers, teachers, Sunday school teachers, wherever you are. Some of them may be in their classrooms preparing. We are so thankful for you, and not all of our teachers are here in this space. It takes a significant team of people to do this work, but we are so grateful for you. Those of you who are teaching our children are planting seeds for a lifetime. Those of you who are teaching our youth and adults are equipping those who have grown up in the church for faith in life. Your role is extremely important. So this morning, we commission you, asking that all that you do is prepared with love, remembering that we are called to do God's work so that you might equip our children, youth, and adults to be faithful disciples out into the world. We give gratitude for you, and we ask you to do God's work with love. Let's pray together. Most holy God, we are so grateful for all who give their lives to teaching, who join us on Sunday mornings, who meet with our children, our youth, and adults, 
bringing words of wisdom, questions that challenge, information that inspires. Be with all of our teachers this year as they prepare their lessons and come with excitement and sometimes a little nervousness to lead conversations and classes. Bless them with your grace. Inspire them with your love. May they do your work knowing that they truly are your disciples. Amen. Let's give thanks for all of our teachers. Thank you. I ask that you remember this morning, as always, that one of the ways we respond to God is by the giving of our resources and gifts so that as together we give, together we can also go out into the world and speak the word of Christ. Amen.
It's time now for our prayers of the people, so let us join together in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you that you are patient with us. For thousands of years now, we've had the words of Scripture to give us guidance, and still we make small, incremental steps along the way in our lives as followers of Jesus Christ. But we do strive. Your Spirit has often been our guide, but other times our own thoughts have led the way. We pray that you will continue to guide us in our daily lives as individuals and especially as a congregation of Jesus Christ. One of the ways we start out when we talk about who we are, we mention that we are people who are people of prayer because we recognize how important it is not only for our prayers to be sent to you, but for us to pray together for those we care about. We pray for all those who are undergoing treatment, for illnesses. We especially pray for Bob Shadburn and Tim Hayden right now. Also, prayers continue for Linda Hoffman and family, and for Shelley King, and for all those who have lost loved ones recently. It sometimes seems as though we know more and more people that have experienced great loss in their lives, but we also recognize that we get through that loss together. We give special thanks for the children and the teachers, and we especially pray for the children as they go into the school year, that above all, they are safe, but also that they are inspired, that their minds are taught to seek and look for the good in others. And we pray that in everything we do, we show that same dedication. We pray for the Presbyterian Church as we continue to listen for God's leading. But then once having come to an agreement on what that means, that we then speak out together. There are so many things we can do to make the lives of other people change for the good. Help us to understand our own power and the own abilities if you have given us. And then let us go forth boldly as followers of Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.
one little bit about that music is we introduced that song last week, that it was a song written in dedication and honor of our Vision 2020 statement. But all we had was a lead sheet, which is just chords and a melody. And if you'll notice on the uh, bulletin there that Chris Krug decided that wasn't good enough. Well, I think I'll just whip up a full accompaniment. <laughs> which you, which I stand before going, I feel so humble. <laughs> is, but the thing is, it also helped remind me that every time I look around this congregation, I am amazed at the many gifts and blessings that people bring to us. Their abilities, their talents, their passions. And I just think if we could get that all corralled a little tighter together, going out and speaking in the words of Jesus Christ, carrying a gift of love that we can really make a difference. So when you leave this place, go knowing that the love of God is always with you. The peace of Jesus Christ is yours for the asking. But you are surrounded by the Holy Spirit, which makes impossible things possible. Amen. Nothing can change the way you love me. Nothing can change the way I belong to you. Child of love, I found the world of freedom. I found a friend of Jesus. I am a child.